Okay, the only proper way to um, introduce this next session is with my glasses on, of course. Um, and I'm old enough that I actually can't read this with my glasses on, so I'm going to have to guess on this. I'm very, very pleased that we have some people joining us who are true hackers, and I think it's fun for the scientists and the hackers to enmesh. There are, of course, examples of people here who embody both disciplines. Um, in any case, this uh, workshop is named Anaglyph, or 3D, three-dimensional gigaplans, gigapans. And the two people who are presenting, to my far left, Jason Buckheim, who's a marine biologist who specializes in coral reef fish ecology. He founded the Odyssey Expedition uh, Tropical Marine Biology Voyages Group. And he leads educational expeditions throughout the Caribbean each summer, teaching students the wonders of the underwater world. And there's outstanding gigapans that he has online and the gigapan.org site, as well as at the Museum of Natural History here in the gallery show. And also joining us, one of our original fine fellows, uh, old fine alumni, and one of our most prolific fine fellows, Ron Schott, is uh, one of the original pilot scientists of the program and has worked hard to push the limits of gigapanning since the fall of 2007. He created the world's first full gigapixel anaglyph gigapan and currently has more public gigapans on gigapan.org that are gigapixel level or higher than anyone else. He has more than 620 gigapixels in more than 550 gigapans by this one individual. And those numbers are actually out of date now. It's about 700 plus gigapans and 850 gigapixels. Well, <laughs> technology. So thank you for being here. Welcome. And uh, we're going to enjoy the presentation. Thank you. So I'll start without the glasses on and just introduce you also to my two field assistants, Bertie and Eddie. Some of you have seen them in my gigapans. They didn't actually make it into any of these anaglyph gigapans, but they wanted to say hi. So um, I have been gigapanning since uh, fall 2007, and uh, I have been prolific. And it was about, I don't know, 50 or 70 gigapans in that I, I got around to thinking, what else could I do with a gigapan besides shoot nice landscapes and uh, the occasional macro. And so I was out in the field one evening uh, shooting this uh, landslide along the Saline River Valley in uh, western Kansas, uh, some of the very little topography you see in western Kansas. And uh, this was a small one. I just shot it as, I think, a 12 by 3 uh, gigapan. Uh, so it's not large, but I thought to myself, well, why don't I just make an anaglyph of this? And, and the way I did this was the simplest technological way you can make an anaglyph. You set up your gigapan, you shoot one gigapan set of images, you take your tripod, you slide it over about a foot, go to last panorama, and you reshoot that same gigapan. That gives you a left eye image and a right eye image, and that's fundamentally all you need to begin to make an anaglyph. So uh, if you have your glasses on, this is, this is the time to put them on. Again, the blue facing outwards, the uh, white to your face. And as you look at the gigapan up there, as I zoom in, let me get, first of all, to a full screen view. Let me get to a, yeah, go ahead, be my guest. Well, it doesn't seem to want to go to a full screen view, but we can still zoom in. And you can really begin to see the 3D effect here with that telephone pole, for example, jumping off the background. Are you all seeing that in 3D? It's looking pretty 3D to me. So that's actually, that's, some of the, uh, this was my first proof of concept gigapan uh, for, for anaglyph uh, uh, type of, of gigapans, and uh, I was rather pleased that that worked. Um, when I uh, actually went through the process of, of uh, stitching these and putting them together, I was following uh, this uh, website. This is the Southern California Earthquake Center. Uh, they have a, a really nice web page here that explains how to make an anaglyph image uh, from two original, a left eye and a right eye image. And you can find this web page very easily on the web by just Googling uh, anaglyph and Photoshop. It's the first result you'll get. And this basically takes you through the, the real basic process. And after I had stitched my two gigapans, I took them into Photoshop as uh, big TIFF images and followed their advice. And, uh, and that's how I got the image that I subsequently uploaded as that anaglyph. So that was, that was my first foray into um, anaglyph gigapanning. Uh, my second, well, a after maybe a few more of those, I decided to go a little bit higher tech. Uh, and I decided on this one to go on to the Pacific Coast. And uh, this is a dual or dueling gigapan units. 
Uh, these were both uh, beta units modified with Canon S5 uh, cameras, but I'll go to full screen and just show you a little bit of what the capture looks like with this. The sound is off right now, but you can see they're working pretty much synchronously. In this case, um, I had set up the field of view uh, with both of them, uh, just standing there side by side. I hit the start button at the same time. I'm using the same units, same cameras, and so uh, they actually work in sync pretty well. Um, it wasn't perfectly in sync, and Jason will tell you more about how to do it better, but that was the, that was the idea of doing that. And the result of that gigapanning effort was this. This was, to my knowledge anyway, the world's first full gigapixel anaglyph gigapan. Uh, this is the Pacific Coast uh, near, uh, north of Bodega Head, California, um, south of uh, Jenner, California. And it's got these really nice sea stacks that jump out at you in the foreground. Uh, and then in the distance you can see um, the uh, the Krumholz on the uh, skyline there and, and other things. There is uh, one point I want to make about this one that shows a little flaw. They weren't quite in sync and you can see a truck there that has moved between the, the two eye images. But uh, you still get a pretty good 3D effect. It's really nice over here on the house and the porch that really kind of pops out at you. Uh, and you saw the spacing on these two was about a foot apart. So I, I kind of went to that as an optimal spacing. Uh, there is one part of this gigapan that didn't come out quite nicely. When you're zoomed out, uh, you can see this uh, foundation here in the foreground, but if you zoom in too far, uh, it, it's going to actually separate. You're not going to be able to see the, uh, the 3D effect quite the way you should. And, and that's even more evident in this other gigapan I shot in western Kansas. Uh, this is uh, near Castle Rock in western Kansas, uh, just Badlands erosional remnants. You can see a really nice 3D effect over here where you've got three levels of view. You've got a rock that's fallen off the cliff here in the foreground, a little hump of uh, bedrock in the background, and then the cliffs uh, further out. Um, this was also one where I was attempting to do something scientific, and so I put a scale rod in there. And uh, that scale rod is, is really what I used when I, when I aligned these two images to, uh, to make sure that they were perfectly aligned. And you can actually read into the uh, tenths of an inch on there. So, uh, that's using the full gigapan capabilities. Uh, this looks really nice until you see the second scale bar that I put in here, which was really the same scale bar, just moved in between shots. And as I try and zoom in on that scale bar, you will notice that you cannot resolve that with your eyes. They separate. Uh, the spacing between those, the red and blue images, is just too much. And this has to do with the, the way the eyes work and where you make the, the crossing point on these two images. Uh, Jason has done a lot since I've done these, and so I'm going to give it to him, and he can explain exactly how he's solved this problem. Thanks, Ron. So I met Ron, I was driving through Kansas, and there's not much to do in Kansas, so I had seen lots and lots of uh, gigapans coming on the gigapan site from this guy that was a professor at Fort Hayes State University. He had actually done one where it was in the quad of the university, and I had explored that before I went to the university, and I, when I arrived there, I was walking around, and I had explored this gigapan before, and I realized that it was a sense of uh, deja vu. I felt like I had actually been there before. But I went up and I met Ron, and he showed me this thing, and it got me thinking, well, that's pretty cool, but you can't zoom in, and it doesn't really work when you zoom in. So it's great to print these out, but in zooming in, it doesn't work. So I put my head on that, and I've been working pretty hard on this, and I've come up with a solution, and we're looking at it here, the same spot, but the, uh, the rule stick is resolved right on the anaglyph. So my solution, what it does is it anaglyphs on the fly. And wherever you move the mouse around, right underneath that spot is a perfect separation so that you don't have any eye strain. And in order to do this, you actually have to have a depth map between the two images. I have uh, created a site here called 3D Pan, 
And this is pretty much in beta, so if everyone hits it all at once, it might do some strange things. Uh, if, if the screen comes up blue, just hit refresh, and there's a couple people out that are shooting a lot of 3D panoramas. One guy named John Topin in California, and another person that no one knows his name, he just has the uh, username Orbelia. I think his name is Guy, and he shoots a lot in Australia and Europe, and he, he does a lot of um, very nice ones with fungi. So we're gonna go and explore some of these. Here is one I took at the top of Aspen Highlands. And to understand what's going on, right now my mouse is pointed on the maroon bells, these beautiful peaks, and you notice in the foreground, you can't really resolve that. It's too much eye strain. But if I move my mouse down, suddenly the image moves around on whatever I'm on, and you can resolve what's in the foreground, but it's pretty hard to see what's in the background. This is really basically how your eye works. You're, when you hold your finger in front of your face and look at your finger, you're actually seeing two people in the background. And if you hold your um, same spot, but you look at the background, suddenly you have two fingers. So this is just doing the same thing, and it reduces eye strain on wherever you look. And it really makes it work well, because you can zoom in on these images now and get a really nice 3D separation. Now, well, I shot this, and it was that interocular, so about a foot, um, a little bit more than a foot. I wanted to hike across this ridge, but as you can see in 3D, I got scared. <laughs> now, this is another ridge that I would love to hike across, but I would, uh, I need a spacecraft to get there. This is on Mars, and it is an incredible canyon. And you can zoom into this and it is so steep. Um, Randy Sargent was able to help me get this image from NASA, it's from the Mars orbiter. And it's pretty amazing stuff. After the talk, when you go home tonight, bring these glasses home and you can explore this. Um, the uh, fungus, I mean, this is just a, a tree with some fungus growing on it. And the amazing thing when you start moving into these 3D images is it's something that wouldn't seem very interesting at all suddenly becomes very engaging. And once again, none of this would work in the standard anaglyphing because everything would get out of alignment when you zoomed in. So what I've done is created something where I have correspondence points between the two images and then wherever the mouse is pointed, it aligns that. So that's why you see it shake around a little bit. I don't have a complete depth map on the whole image. It's only about maybe 300 points defined and that's pretty much good enough to allow the viewer to resolve on whatever part you're looking at. <coughs> this one, you really get a nice 3D feel with the trees. So once again, images that just wouldn't be very interesting in 2D suddenly become really interesting and you can find yourself engaging in these things in ways that you never realized you could do. And the great thing is it's just 30 cent glasses. You don't have to have a very expensive TV or an IMAX theater. Ron actually shot this image. It's of a refinery in Kansas. And it's going to show a couple of the challenges with using the method where you um, stitch with one camera and then move it and do the next. You can see that some of the characters in here, the birds, are not in one eye. And so if you blink from one eye to the next, the birds move around. Um, I'll also point out real quickly the clouds move significantly between the two images there as well. Oh. 
with this viewer, you can also do a side-by-side. -side. In this case, you really don't need the glasses. You can take this off. Um, but this is a synchronized view of fall and spring. So once again, I take correspondence points between the two images, and then you can move them around. I have a presentation that you can look at. It's actually a GigaPan. I decided not to make this as the standard PowerPoint presentation, but instead make it as a GigaPan for you. You might have seen me using this setup earlier that had two cameras on, mounted on one GigaPan unit. That's a very nice way to do this. You don't have to do that though. You can do it with one GigaPan. You can have a friend and you can both set up and um, have it with two GigaPans firing at the same time. The advantage of having them fire at the same time is you're not going to have things in one view that aren't in the next view if there's birds or cows or something moving around. Um, but it's pretty hard to carry two GigaPan units into the field. There's one very nice thing that you can do when you mount both of the cameras on one GigaPan unit. With the units mounted and just separated, you're not able to capture an entire scene in 3D. And if I just step to the side and demonstrate this, when Here's my field of view, and um, when I turn my head, one eye is, if I turn my head, I still get the stereoscopic scene. But if I just turn my eyes, my distance between the eyes is getting closer and closer. So if you are using these two methods. I was just gonna say, I, if I'm the second camera, all right, point both of our cameras in the same direction, they're shooting down the same line. There. Right, don't you have that here, stereo base spread. Here, we lose our separation. So you can't shoot a full 360 spherical image with the two cameras on separate mounts. But that's all right on gigapans because you can shoot something that's very far away. Um, I'm not going to go into every aspect of this presentation because you are certainly able to view it online. There are some alternatives to having to have two cameras. There's a Fuji camera that has two lenses built into it, and people are having good luck with that. There's a new double lens on a Panasonic camera, and there's some sort of mirror attachment that you can put on your camera. And with these, you have a static distance between the lenses. This is some close-ups of the actual unit that I use. It's just a piece of wood mounted with two cameras on it, and I had to make a circuit that would fire both images at the same time. Uh, if you have a Canon set up, there's actually a circuit that you can buy, and on this page I have the website for it. It's called Gent Stereo Pro, and it just looks something like that, and it hooks into the USB ports and would be able to fire both cameras at the same time. I used something called a Arduino Pro Mini, and you can get these for $20 from SparkFun, and a couple relays um, soldered into it. This is definitely a solder project, but then you can uh, create your own release. So this is less than $30 worth of pieces, and it's in high resolution. I don't know why it's not resolving. Okay, some different methods of viewing. There's parallel and cross viewing, and this has been around for ages, the stereoscopes. There's gonna be a new application Hasbro is coming out with that should be out by December that allows you to view these on an iPhone with this little attachment that sticks on the front of your iPhone, and you have a left and right view, and it's gonna move around wherever you're looking is the scene that you're gonna see. The anaglyph is a great way to view because it's just 30 cent glasses and it doesn't distort too bad. If you have a lot of uh, money, you can buy two projectors and outfit everyone with polarized glasses and this is what the IMAX theaters do. And the TVs, for $2,500, you can buy a nice 3D TV that has $100 shutter glasses that are flicker back and forth. 
This site that I put together, 3D Pan, will allow you to view these in any of those methods, cross view, parallel view, anaglyph, or shutter glasses. And of course you can, um, anyways, the uh, special considerations for gigapans. You need to think about your stereo base separation. I've outlined some math here for you, but it, I've, they'll, we'll make it a bit easier for you. You need a 130 rule. So the minimum object distance you're taking a photo of is uh, divided by 30, and that's how far apart you'd like to have your trees. So if you put, I mean, your stereo base separation, I was looking at a tree. If you put your images, if you put your glasses back on, we can look at this image of these trees. And I have done something here. We have hypo stereo, ortho stereo, and hyper stereo. Ortho is what you would expect your regular eyes to see on this really crazy live oak. Um, and hypo is when there wasn't quite enough separation, and hyper is when there's a lot of separation. Hyper has the effect of making things look smaller and further away. So it's kind of a way to minimize kind of like a small town effect, but it can be hard to view that way. And these are the uh, same images in cross view. Now, this 3D pan site, here's a demonstration of exactly what is going on. You don't have to have images of the same size. They don't have to be the same resolution. You just set the relative zoom ratio between the two, and then you go through and you pick out points that correspond between the two images. And as I move my mouse around here, you can see how it's shifting around. So wherever underneath where the mouse is is where the perfect anaglyph part takes place. And a quick demonstration then on how to actually align. And you're welcome to do this. The site is active. What you need to do is you take your GigaPan ID for each image. In this case, it's 34819 and 34816. And on, you can email me for a password. And then you're going to add correspondence points. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to zoom in and find a point in this image. I need to find the same point, and right now it has none, so it's a bit challenging. I'm lost, I'm sorry. <laughs> This wasn't a good image to choose because they're so different sized. Okay. So I can just add a correction point. Now, in order to really get this working well, I need to add lots of correction points because What's going on is it's changing between the two images. And my viewer takes the average of the four nearest neighbors and moves it around to that. So once I get four points aligned, then it's going to start working. Now, I'm sure there would be some ways to do this with some fancy software that X-Red Studio has, 
and finding some points that would line up automatically. But you really don't have to have thousands of points, just enough for every point of interest in the image. And then the fun thing about this is you get to engage yourself with the images and get to know them very well. So that's the whole steps is to have the IDs between the two images. So you take a, a panorama, you upload them to Gigapan, you have the Gigapan IDs, 34819 is the right eye image, 34816 is the left eye image. I have to have a relative ratio of the field of view. In this case, it was 91 degrees and 51 degrees, and that sets the zoom ratio between these two images, and then I can just add the correspondence points. Then when I want to actually see the result, And this site takes a couple seconds to load up. It's got a lot of data it has to load up. But here's the pair that we just synchronized. So they weren't even the same size images at all, and they're able to synchronize. Now, of course, I didn't put any points over here, and the image was curved. So without that, it's not going to synchronize there, because I haven't added any points. But where I have added points, it works great. Um, Randy wanted me to show a couple other things on the 3D pen site. Here is one of Pittsburgh. And I'm going to do this as the cross view. Oh, I'm sorry, I clicked the wrong one. Uh, here's an example. If you can learn how to cross your eyes, then you can actually have a great 3D viewing effect that doesn't require glasses, and you get the full color. But it, it takes a bit of technique to cross your eyes and allow a third image to form between those two. It may be if you stick your finger in front of your face and notice that a third image forms and then try and focus on that third image. It's something that you don't need any equipment at all. You get a full view without any glasses and you get the full color. Okay, this is the uh, view that many people take of the campus, and it's synchronized between the two images, but separated by a few decades. And when I went through this, I was amazed how, like, this bridge is still the same, but so few other buildings are the same. There's these huge cathedrals in the old image that don't even show up in the new image. So I'm not from uh, this area, but here's one that's there. And here's one that was replaced. Another thing that you could do with the side-by-side -side viewers is look at before and after. This is a change in vegetation um, when grazing methods were changed. Of course, the lighting is just a little bit different.
And here is one that is the by Gene Cooper, who's in the audience maybe, or I think he's in the other room doing a presentation right now. But this is the top side and bottom side of a moth. And it's not going to be in 3D, but you can see if you close one eye, you see one view. If you close the other eye, you see the other view, the top side and the bottom side. And this is fully synchronized. He did an amazing job lining this up. And if you'd like to see that as a side-by-side, He has a microscope set up in the back that kind of displays how he produces these. All right. I'm welcome to answer any questions you might have about how to do this stuff then. Uh, this is all entirely written in ActionScript, so it's a flash viewer. And the underlying viewer is something called KR Pano. And there's a, a big hack in order to display two KR Panos in one script. So don't try it at home. It's available for you to use. Just plug in your IDs. That's the great thing about this. You don't have to pull any of it into Photoshop. You don't have to deal with great big files. You can upload it directly with the Gigapan Stitcher and then just grab the IDs and align them. There's no extra software steps, just finding those points. And then uh, it's kind of fun to find all those points. I'd love to have a, a way to do it automatically. But for now, you get to know your images really well. I should point out that working with these things, especially very large image files in Photoshop, does build character. <laughs> Are you familiar with PT GUI? Sure. PT GUI is a great program. He, uh, you, you, in the new version, you can save off the control points. Mm -hmm. It might be able to use that instead of the control points. Or them together. It'd be very easy to do that. Uh, I've already got it. I just don't have the script to pull in those points, but it might be a better way to make the control points. You might be able, in AutoPano, you can just kind of paint regions and create control points. So lots of ways to automate this, just haven't done it yet. But once again, you don't need thousands of control points. Any others? Are there other options for that? You showed us uh, left and right. Like I can imagine like the historical or something that's in a panoramic format. You might want it over under or Easy. Other, other kinds of things. You, you can, think about those? I don't have the, the button on there yet, yeah. <laughs> but you can do over under. Uh, you could mirror them. You could do left and right. You can do the anaglyph. You can do a swap view where it swaps it very fast. Thin sections where you should have plain polarized light and cross polarized light, and you want to switch between the scenes. That's yeah. exactly what I have. Or if you yeah. want uh, some interpretation. Exactly. I'm going to ask a question. What's next? You're, you're doing, and both of you, fantastic work in pushing the frontier of what to do with very large images. What, what do you want to do next? <laughs> Terrific. Terrific. That, that, that's for me the next goal. Resolution. No, TerraPixel total upload is in this. Uh-oh. <laughs> That's my next immediate goal. How about yours, Jason? Uh, well, one thing that scared me, I've been working so much on this the uh, last few days to get it working. And I was flying up here on the airplane, and I'm looking out the window, and I kind of wanted to see what was over there. And I felt myself reaching up to the window to pan it over. <laughs> 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 I 
I really like underwater um, gigapans. I'd like to create a uh, underwater gigapan setup. That's my next goal would be able to have some very engaging imaging going on underwater. Well, we have NASA here. They want that too. And we know many, many uh, biologists, marine biologists, who also want that. So I think we have a good few users for you. Great. Well, let's thank Jason and Ron again.